Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper, one of your two hosts. And I'm your second host, Aaron Maté. Hey, everybody. Very excited to be joined this week by our guest, Ofer Kasif, who is an Israeli politician. Very excited to talk to him. He's taken uh, a lot of heat for his positions, including getting dismissed by the parliament. So uh, very excited to talk to him. And uh, as always, we invite you to give yourselves the gift of a Useful Idiot subscription so you can see the full interview that we do with Ofer as well as the full interviews we do every week. And also, of course, the Thursday Throwdown, which is your midweek dose of media madness, which is when we react to uh, midweek media clips that are really ridiculous. And boy, oh boy, are they ridiculous this week. And this week's Thursday Throwdown features such luminaries as Fox News host Jesse Waters, who claims he's done with Palestine, which is a huge, a huge blow to the Palestinian solidarity movement. Jesse they Waters is a huge ally yeah, known for his staunch advocacy for Palestinian rights, for equality. And then we feature a whole bevy of uh, U.S. lawmakers using this current moment to dust off an old favorite, which is calling for bombing Iran, because yeah. why not? Why not? Yeah, that's what the world needs now. That's right. We need to ratchet it up. That's right. Yes. Forget diplomacy. And you can do that, of course, at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. But it wouldn't be a Useful Idiots regular show without the four basic food groups. Democrats suck. Republicans suck. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? I have Democrats suck. And boy, oh boy, does it break my heart to do this Democrat suck. <sighs> Let's just go to the tweet. This is Bernie, who used to be called Amo Bernie affectionately, which is um, uncle in Arabic. Uh, he earned that nickname for his uh, good work around uh, Palestine. And sadly, he tweeted this um, on October 25th. Israel has a right to defend itself against Hamas, but innocent Palestinians also have right to life and security. I'm calling for a humanitarian pause by all parties so that critical aid can be delivered to the suffering people of Gaza and for the immediate release of all hostages. Bernie... I think you know that you should be calling for a ceasefire. Not just because it's the right thing to do and you've been good on this issue in the past, but because your former staffers and current staffers are calling you on you to do that. Let's take a look at this video. Hi, Bernie. Hey, Bernie. Hi, Senator Sanders. My name is Raya Almasor. My name is Kevin Rabinovich. My name is Young Jung Cho. Nuseba. David Shore. Rihanna Blewett. Michaela Kaplan. Anna Fertig. Lakshmi Devi Gopal. Daniela. Becca Rast. Waleed Shahid. My name is Erica Anglin, and I work for you, Bernie. My name is Shabad Singh, and I work for you, Bernie. We were inspired by your campaign and leadership, in part because of your deep anti-war convictions. I am opposed to giving the president a blank check to launch a unilateral invasion and occupation of Iraq. Your fight for dignity and justice for all. And your deep commitment to the basic humanity of all Israelis and Palestinians. We are gonna have to treat the Palestinian people with respect and dignity. As a fellow Jewish American, this is something that I've always admired about you and why I came to work for you. We are disappointed that you have not taken leadership in this moment calling for a ceasefire, particularly when grief is being weaponized by American politicians to support horrific atrocities by Israel against Palestinian civilians. And all of this is funded by our government. Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! We are seeing a revitalization of the anti-war and pro-peace movement across the country. People of all races and faiths and backgrounds coming together for a political revolution in our foreign policy. And you inspired a lot of these people, these activists on the streets today. You, Bernie, are the strongest voice in the U.S. Senate on progressive foreign policy. We ask you to stand up more forcefully, as you always have, against war and bombs and for peace, freedom and justice. Thank you for already speaking up about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the importance of releasing all hostages but we know our government can do more. Please call for a ceasefire. And introduce a Senate companion to the ceasefire now resolution introduced by Representative Rashida Tlaib and Representative Cory Bush. Support an end to military funding for atrocities or occupation of Palestinian people. If not now, when? If not you and us, then who? We believe in you. We believe in you. We believe in you. So I think that speaks for itself. Uh, I think they make the case. And I think, Bernie, you, on on some level, 
know that that's the right thing to do. Um, I know that you've spoken out about this issue. You are one of the Jews who makes the argument um, never again for anyone. You haven't said that. I'm summarizing. Um, I'm paraphrasing what I've taken from your positions. You had lost your family in the Holocaust, and that has made you realize the humanity of everyone as opposed to um, just Jews and just Israelis. And that's one of the things that your staff, former staffers and um, people like me really admire. And I just want to share this one tweet because I think maybe, I, I, I don't know, maybe it'll reach you. I find it really heartbreaking and I think it, it needs to be seen. So this is a tweet from um, Stephen uh, Sosabi, who is the founder of the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. And he tweeted this out and says, this is Mujahid. He was seven years old. We treated him in our cancer department. This was the last drawing, a message of thanks for the chemo he received while living in the blockaded Gaza Strip. Last night, a bomb was dropped on his home, killing him and his entire extended family. And um, there he is, the seven-year-old, and there's his drawing, which says, thank you. And I know this is just one of the many um, people who have been killed, but that's just so heartbreaking. The idea that he already, under the blockade, was able to get this chemotherapy. And by the way, the survival rates of can for cancer in Gaza are much lower than they are for the survival rates in Israel because of the medical blockade. But the fact that he was able to, I guess, get this chemotherapy just to be killed by bombs dropped by Israel with America's backing and blessing is just horrific. And we all have that on our consciences right now. You know, Bernie, I have to say, has not always been good on Palestine. In 2014, during the summer of Israeli massacres there, he defended Israel's so-called right to defend itself. Then in 2016, during the primary, he did pivot and started speaking over Palestinian rights. And I have to wonder now, was that a genuine transformation or was it just trying to appeal to the Arab American vote during that campaign against Hillary Clinton? Whatever it was, his position now is, I think, a complete betrayal of everything he supposedly stands for. And I think a major factor is he chooses these foreign policy aides uh, who constantly cater to the bipartisan neocon establishment. Previously, it was Matt Duss who was not bad on Palestine, but is yeah, he was good on Palestine, yeah. But is uh, pretty awful on everything else. And now it's someone named Max Hoffman, who also, like Matt does, comes from the Center for American Progress, a, you know, a, a progressive liberal think tank in, in D.C. And um, it's just amazing. This is the best we can do in this country. Our progressive leader can't even bring himself to call for an end to a genocide. The best he can do is adopt the line of Antony Blinken, which is, humanitarian pause. So basically he wants to pause the massacres, not end them. That's Bernie's yeah. position. I mean, to his credit, he is actually calling for, I mean, I, and I, I, I'm damning him with faint praise here, but he's calling for the pause as opposed to Blinken who wants to consider it. But of course it's totally insufficient. It's insufficient. We need uh, a ceasefire now. And you know, the irony is that the ceasefire doesn't just help save the lives of Palestinians, but given that we don't know where these, prisoners are, these captives are, they very easily could be in the buildings that are being bombed. So if you care about the Israeli captives, you should want a ceasefire. All right, let's turn to Republicans suck. The Republican Party lining up 100% to support Israel and Gaza, but also lining up to call for bombing Iran. So we covered this a little bit in Thursday Throwdown, but we have some more examples, all from Fox News. And Iran should be, everybody should understand, make it very clear to Iran. We know they've got their hands on Hezbollah and Hamas as well. And they need to understand, if Hezbollah enters this fight, you are culpable and we are going to come after you. But Blinken, and Blinken's comments were very good, but the wrong person issued the comments. Yeah. Those need to come from the White House. Those need to come from the President of the United States. Yeah, you're the right. The Commander in Chief. That, that is spot on. Uh, do you think we could go to war with Iran? 
Well, I don't think it would be. I, the answer is yes. I, we should be able to do it, and they should believe that because they should fear us and they should respect us, not just say, well, we really don't believe they're going to do it. Yeah. We have enough combat capability in the Mediterranean to do something. In Iran, and the Supreme Leader Khamenei needs to understand, if you come after us, we're going to come after you. Look, Maria, well, over 30 coming, Americans I mean, have been killed. There's a lot of attacks. Were hostages. There have been a lot of attacks on U.S. Right. troops. In the last seven days, we've been attacked nine times by Iran and their proxies and surrogates. Right now, the only response to this is not to block a punch, is to return one. And until we do, we're going to continue to be the victim in this. And you're absolutely right. It will not stop unless we stop it. This is a direct uh, attack on the United States. You kill our boys, you kill our boys and women and so forth. You kill our armed services. This, this armed forces, that's a direct attack. Unfortunately, this has got to be stopped. I don't know what it's going to take to do it. I hope it's not the death of an American civilian or service member, but that's where we're headed. It's pretty extraordinary. You have this bloodbath going on in Gaza, the, all these massacres. The Republican Party firmly in lockstep behind that, with maybe a couple of exceptions in the House. But they're not just content to be killing Palestinians en masse in Gaza. They also want to expand this to a new front and have a war with Iran. It's almost worse than the period after 9-11. Um, or at least it's just as bad. All the jingoism and the war fever of then, it's, it's come right back. It would be nice if they learned a lesson. If the American people made it so that there was a political cost to this. But I don't know. I guess... I guess the lesson wasn't learned, which is depressing. How many more people need to die before people understand this? A lot more people, unfortunately, according to these, according to these ruling uh, elites. It's just a, that's what they're calling for is a lot more death. It's it's hard to fathom. Yeah. Also, Khomeini, get a just. It's not even how you say it, but whatever. That's that's a that's a minor detail. If only that was his only mistake. <laughs> okay, what do we have for Isn't That Weird? So for Isn't That Weird, we have a heartwarming, uh, record-breaking story. 465 couples share spaghetti strands for romantic world record attempt. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the great film uh, Lady and the Tramp, but it features a uh, an Italian kiss, as it's called, which is a term for when two people share a single strand of pasta until it either breaks or ends with the eater's lips touching. Previously, there was a record held by the restaurant Vapiano um, when I believe uh, 433 couples did that. Uh, then they got it to 465 couples. <laughs> So they, they did it, guys. They broke the record. That's a fun record to break. Combines two of two great pastimes, kissing and eating pasta. Aaron, how much would you how much would you have to be paid to do that? Or how drunk um, would you have to be? How much would I have to be paid to engage in that competition? Yeah. Or just forget the competition, just to do the Italian kiss in public in a restaurant. I'm not above doing that. I, you know. Um, oh, you do it for free even? Yeah, no, I don't I don't shame the Italian kiss. Sure. Okay, yeah. good. No. Yeah. What I don't, what I'm not crazy about is that this is a little bit a callback to the Axis during World War II. I don't like generally when Italians and Germans come together for things, although I'd rather mm -hmm. them come together for the Italian kiss. And of course, this is an Italian kiss. Uh, and this competition was done in Germany. So I have mixed feelings. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't notice that holo that uh, World War Two tie. So, yeah. OK, for isn't that terrible? We're going to look at a terrible acting job. And it comes from White House spokesperson John Kirby. And let's compare how John Kirby reacts to U.S.-backed Israeli atrocities in Gaza versus Russian atrocities inside of Ukraine. So here he is speaking now about how people are going to die in Gaza and that's just the way it is. This is war. It is combat. It is bloody. It is ugly. And it's going to be messy. And innocent civilians are going to be hurt going forward. I wish I could tell you something different. I wish that that wasn't going to happen, uh, but it is it is going to happen. And uh, that doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it uh, d dismissible. It, it doesn't mean that we aren't going to still e express concerns about that and, and do everything we can to help the Israelis do everything they can to minimize it. Uh, but uh, but that's, that's unfortunately the, the nature of conflict. So that's John Kirby 
declaring that, yes, yeah, sorry, Gaza Palestinians, but you're going to have to die. In fact, a lot more of you are going to have to die. Well, compare that to how John, John Kirby has talked about Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, it's hard to look at what he's doing in Ukraine, what his forces are doing in Ukraine, and think that any um, uh, ethical, moral individual could justify that. It's difficult to look at the Sorry. It's difficult to look at some of the images and imagine that any well-thinking, serious, mature leader would do that. <clears throat> so I can't talk to his psychology, but uh, I think we can all speak to his depravity. Okay, so that's John Kirby fighting off tears, apparently, as he talks about Russia's depravity in Ukraine. But Previously, we saw him talk about Israeli depra depravity inside Gaza, and he's saying that's the way it is, and it's going to have to continue. And in fact, already in just a few weeks, Israel has killed more children in Gaza than Russia has in nearly two years of war inside of Ukraine. So I don't understand why John Kirby can't find his tears when talking about Gaza. He because can, he's though, wasted them, Aaron. He's You see, he's wasted them already on... Right. He's he's all tapped out. He's cried so much over the Ukra uh, Ukrainian children that he has none left for the Palestinian children. I'm sure it's that. I'm sure it's not that he's faking it or is racist or is a craven person who doesn't care about the blood of Palestinian children. He's tapped out of tears. Tapped out of tears. Um, DOT. And just, and just to underscore this, he did manage to find some more television tears when talking about the Israelis who died when Hamas attacked Israel. I, uh, <clears throat> I, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's very, <clears throat> excuse me, very difficult to look at these images, Jake, uh, it, it, and the, the, the human cost, and these are human beings, they're family members, they're friends, they're loved ones, cousins, brothers, sisters, yeah, it's difficult, and I apologize. You should apologize. You should apologize because you are a disgusting person who doesn't care about Palestinians. You have no tears for Palestinians. Somehow, I guess you proved me wrong with my tapped out of tears theory, uh, which I, of course, was being sarcastic with. But that's a disgusting thing to see the contrast between his tears over Israeli victims. And I'd be glad if he had tears over Israeli victims and Palestinian victims. But seeing him cry over Israeli victims and have a what are you going to do attitude over Palestinian victims is inexcusable. But also, in a way, I want to thank him because he just captures exactly what's wrong and uh, with the U.S. foreign policy, which sees humanity in one side of this issue and sees a lack of humanity on the other side and despicable. And he's also a terrible actor. Okay, that's true too. Terrible actor. You're right. That's we probably should have. I mean, you're right. I went. I went for the. I, I went. I went macro. But you're right. We we could have done a breakdown of his thespian skills. So it's terrible on two levels, the acting and the content. We're really excited to be speaking to Ofer Kasif. He is an Israeli politician, a member of the Knesset since April 2019, and he represents the Hadash Party. And he was recently uh, suspended. An Israeli Parliament Ethics Committee suspended him uh, over comments criticizing Israel's assault on Gaza. Thank you so much, Ofer, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And I just wanted to start off by offering um, my condolences because I know that you know some people who were killed on October 7th so that's cool um, thank you so much yeah unfortunately many of them and some were kidnapped and I don't know what's what's going on with them at the moment of course so we're going to get into um what got you in trouble but before that could you just explain to people what the Hadash party is that you're part of yes of course Hadash stands for the Democratic Front for Peace and Equality it was established uh, in 1976-77 based on the Communist Party of Israel. 
for reasons that I can specify if you want, uh, but I don't know if it's very relevant. But basically, it's the only uh, parliamentarian Jewish Arab uh, group or list. Uh, it's a movement movement that uh, endorses, in principle, the uh, partnership of Jews and the uh, Palestinians, and uh, and we are the only one who actually uh, and has endor been endorsing it ever since we exist. So, and of course, uh, a leftist uh, movement in any uh, you know dimension you can you could imagine. Uh, Definitely, as far as the Palestinian right for self-determination and ending the occupation is concerned, in the struggle against racism, Jewish supremacy in Israel, and for uh, profound equality, uh, including national equality, and, and but also in the social and economic issues, we are much more to the left. We consider ourselves to be socialists, and uh, so that's you know in a nutshell. Got it. And what is it that you said that got you suspended by the ethics panel of the Knesset for 45 days? First, allow me to say that there is now persecution of every and uh, any voice which is uh, uh, in opposition to the war and to the uh, uh, assault on Gaza. Of course, we are totally against and condemn the massacre that carried out by Hamas, that's for sure. But at the same time, we oppose the massacre that Israel carries out against uh, Gaza. And uh, unfortunately, since the massacre, and, and uh, especially in the last week or so, uh, there's a persecution of uh, any opposition voice, anyone who opposes the war in the name of peace and uh, calls for ceasefire, or even expresses basic sympathy for the children of Gaza. Uh, is persecuted and sometimes even prosecuted. That means that it is, for, in, for instance, in Israel now, it's totally prohibited uh, to demonstrate. It's forbidden to demonstrate against the war uh, or uh, calling for ceasefire or peace. And the people who try to demonstrate are uh, violently beaten by police and they are not allowed to demonstrate. Today, there was supposed to be, yesterday actually, there was supposed to be a Jewish-Arab meeting initiated by the uh, <clears throat> follow-up uh, committee of the uh, uh, Arab citizens in Israel. Uh, again, calling for peace, ceasefire, and condemning any assault on innocent civilians, Israelis and Palestinians alike, of course, and the police just threatened the hall, the uh, owners of the hall, that if he was allowed for such a meeting to take place, the police was going to close, to shut down the hall. And uh, the, the police did so with two halls, so it, uh, it was cancelled. Instead, there was a press conference today in, the, uh, in Nazareth uh, referring to this uh, persecution. And, of course, uh, uh, there, are, there are hundreds of citizens, especially Palestinian citizens in Israel, but also some Jewish that were interrogated or even arrested because they expressed opposition to the war, support for ceasefire or sympathy for the innocent civilians in Gaza. And I em emphasize the civilians and not Hamas because everybody is against Hamas among us, absolutely. Uh, on top of that, by the way, and on top, on top of some bills that are already exist and are supposed or are about to become laws, unfortunately, there are uh, people who were fired from the workplace because of the same thing. For instance, a friend of mine, a, a, a very you know old activist against occupation, a teacher and a very good teacher, I must say, of, uh, he is a very well uh, acclaimed teacher for many years. Not only that he was fired from the school where he was teaching because he dared to express opposition to the war and called for ceasefire, uh, but he also got a letter the other day, yesterday or the day before, from the education board saying that his license to teach altogether is revoked. So we cannot even teach in anywhere because he's, he cannot be regarded as holding a, a teaching license. And, and there's another example of a guy that the day before yesterday 
ten armed policemen broke in violence to his uh, apartment because he had a sign on the balcony said uh, uh, that there's no holiness in occupied city. It was in Jerusalem and the slogan is uh, rhymes in Hebrew. Uh, and the sign is there for many months, but now they broke and just took, it, took him uh, to arrest. So my lot, you know, uh, my suspension for 45 days is uh, relatively marginal if we compare it to the, to the destiny of a Palestinian citizens in particular and some others like the examples I gave. So it is now in Israel there is a vicious dicta- dictatorial fascist assault on citizens who, again, I have to emphasize, I uh, in the, there's no, no one bit or shred of a sympathy uh, or a support or perish the thought justification for uh, the Hamas's uh, carnage. We all agree that Hamas made a, a war crime, a, a, an atrocity that not human being, no human being can not a, a, a only endorse, but even to think to justify a bit of it. No one among those I mentioned expressed any support but disgust at Hamas. But the government, which is a fascist government, a full-fledged government, a fascist government for the beginning, before the massacre and the consequences, they want to use it as an excuse to wage war against civil rights. What they didn't achieve, what the government didn't achieve in the so-called, quote-unquote, judicial reform, which is better be regarded as a coup d'etat, by the way, not a judicial reform, uh, what the government didn't succeed in uh, in, uh, achieving in the attempts to to execute a a coup d'etat and to eliminate the independence of the uh, uh, judicial uh, system they now do under the smoke screen of the massacre and the uh, the war mm. so there's a huge persecution of people including members of the Knesset like myself this is a political persecution it has nothing to do with ethical uh, misdeme- misdemeanor so to speak well, and what is it that you said that they're claiming is worthy of dismissal Basically, there were three things that I said. Uh, one of them was not exactly what I said, but it didn't really interest them. First, I said that the, that the government of Israel carries out a massacre in Gaza. And I continue saying that because that's the truth. Because I care about my society, that caring about my society, my state, my co-patriots, and I do. That's something very important to say. I'm not anti-Israeli. The government is anti-Israeli. So my and my friends struggle is for the benefit of all Palestinians and Israelis alike. And our struggle against the government is because the government undermines the security and the well-being of the state and its citizens. So when I say that the government of Israel is uh, carrying out a massacre in Gaza is because first, that's the truth. And second, because my struggle for justice is also for making my state a just place. And uh, so I'm committed to those values of democracy, of justice, of peace, of uh, nonviolence. I'm committed to the public that voted for us because of those values. So when they don't allow me to use the term massacre, they actually, massacre, they actually don't allow me to, to... represent those who elected me exactly for saying things like that. So that was one thing, that I used the term massacre. massacre. The second is that I said that the government of Israel was interested in confrontation and violence. Now, I didn't say, and I w- and I wouldn't like to say, and I won't say, and I don't believe that the government wanted, wanted that uh, terrible slaughter that Hamas did. That's not what I said. That's not what I mean. What I did say and mean to say, and I repeat it time and time again, because again, as I said before, that's the truth, and that's what I'm committed to. 
for values, for truth, for public, for my public, and for my co-patriots, even if they hate me. That's it. The, what I said is that the government was interested in one or another kind of confrontation or violence. Again, not, uh, not at this level, of course, of the massacre. I didn't mean that. They were interested and, they, and led to, to a confrontation in order to pursue their fascist policies. In other words, as I said before, once they failed in uh, realizing their coup d'etat because of the protest in the streets and perhaps some too mild in my view pressure from abroad, from the international community, then he needed an alternative to you to be used as an excuse to uh, carry uh, carry on with this uh, uh, plan, with this project, with this fascist project that I can specify in, in length later if we have the time and you like me to. So that was the second thing that uh, the uh, ethics committee didn't really like me to say. The, the third thing, which apparently is the more... Uh, serious one, as it were, is that apparently I said that what Israel has been doing in the last three weeks or two weeks in uh, Gaza is the final solution of the Palestinian problem. Now, that's uh, not exactly what I said. I have to be very frank. What I did say a few months ago at the Knesset, in the plenum, in a speech, May, much a long time before the massacre of Hamas, I did say that the subjugation plan that perhaps I can specify later, the subjugation plan that was initiated and published by Bezalel Smotrich, that is a minister now, six, six, six years ago, resembles the final solution. That's what I said. And in an interview I had with a, an, a, an Irish uh, interviewer, a host, uh, so he said that uh, about something that reminds me in the, in the final solution. And I said, that's what I said a few months ago regarding the plan of Smotriches. So they uh, uh, concluded in the ethics committee that I said that Israel carries out the final solution in the Gaza Strip. I must say two things. First, I didn't compare. I didn't say that. They were interested in uh, sub suspending me because of political bias and political reasons and interests. Secondly, I think it's totally legitimate to say that. I didn't, but I think it's legitimate to say that. Uh, so that's in a nutshell, although I was long <laughs> but uh, but that's a serious nutshell let me quote something to you from the times of israel it says this quote the israeli army is concerned that further hostage releases by hamas could lead the political leadership to delay a ground incursion or even halt it midway unquote so if i understand that passage correctly that's the israeli army saying that they're concerned that more israeli hostages will be released because that could interfere with plans for a ground invasion of Gaza. Um, what do you make of that report? Uh, first of all, I, 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 I'm not sure that that's the right interpretation because, you know, it looks to me to be uh, too crazy and too malicious, you know, to object to release of hostages. Uh, look, I'm the first one who admit, to admit and say that the a uh, current government of Israel consists of lunatics and fanatics. And uh, they, uh, unfortunately, perhaps constitute even the, if not the majority of the ministers in the government, so at least uh, close to, uh, to half of it. I, I'm also uh, one to, to say that uh, among the generals, there are some lunatics and fanatics. Uh, but it seems to me to be too much. Uh, I, th I, I, I I find it very difficult to believe that anyone can uh, object to a uh, release of hostages because it may uh, put a ground incursion into risk. Uh, of course, I'm against any ground incursion anyway, and I can explain later why. But to your specific question, I want to believe that that's... Uh, that that's a uh, fake and uh, it, it's 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 too harsh to believe in something like that it's worth noting that times of israel is a right-wing paper right it's not like a yeah a left-wing paper yeah 
Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Uh, but what do you make of the current Israeli strategy of uh, bombarding Gaza and, you know, not engaging in full-scale negotiations with Hamas on some kind of prisoner exchange? After Hamas, by the way, has already released four people, civilians. Yeah, that's true. Uh, look, uh, I, I, you, you will never hear any positive words from me uh, uh, regarding Hamas. Uh, and uh, let's begin with that. And uh, but uh, of course, we and I myself we are totally against the uh, atrocities that Israel uh, carries out uh, against Gaza, because there's no justification for war crimes. Hamas committed a terrible war crime against Israel and Israelis. No doubt about it. Does this justify the war crime that Israel carries out? Absolutely not. Bombarding the the, the biggest open, open uh, uh, prison on earth, open air, uh, you know, uh, 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 ghetto of Gaza. To bombard it, a small, relatively a small area in which. Two and a half million people are crowded. Everybody knows what the consequences are. Everybody knows who's going to pay the price. Up till now, there are about 6,500, if not more, uh, casualties. The vast majority are innocent civilians that have nothing to do with Hamas, let alone with the massacre that Hamas uh, uh, did in, uh, in Israel. And more than 2,000, about 2,500, I think, children are among the casualties, are among, among the uh, killed ones. Nothing can justify it. Nothing at all. And Israel, uh, the government of Israel, or Israel, official Israel, uh, doesn't even try to refrain from targeting civilians. In the past, they tried to say, although I've never believed it, that they tried to refrain from it. But, and I don't believe it because if you look at the numbers, you can see that the, the vast majority always were civilians. But let alone now, they don't even try to hide. They actually explicitly say that they are not going to distinguish between civ uh, civilians and, uh, and Hamas uh, terrorists. They even say so. So absolutely opposition to that. First and foremost, because this is a war crime, Nothing justifies war crimes. And secondly, uh, because it doesn't deliver any security to the Israelis and to Israel, well, uh, let alone the Palestinians, that's for sure, by definition. It's only an assault driven by revenge, a cold-blooded and cold-hearted revenge that will deliver neither security no peace, of course. The, the only incentive is because uh, the government of Israel and the security forces of Israel were embarrassed by the incursion of Hamas, and they want to hit back in order to uh, get back their honor, as it were. Those things do not justify, nothing justifies war crimes, nothing justifies assaulting innocent civilians in Israel, in Palestine, or anywhere else. And on top of that, nothing justifies it, if it even, or on top of that, or even further, it cannot be justified, given that even the reason and incentive has nothing to do with security. And everybody knows that. <laughs> Ceasefire and exchange of prisoners and hostages that's what should have been done two weeks ago. And, and of course, now, that's the only thing. People are at risk. The Israelis who are in hostages are at risk. Their death is at stake. Their life is at stake. And the state seems not to care about it. I do. I want those people, including some I know personally, but as a matter of principle, of morality, of values, I want those people to be released and everybody knows what the price is. So exchange of prisoners and hostages and kid the kidnapped immediately, that's the moral decree. And of course, ceasefire. Ceasefire should be uh, also achieved on the spot, given that it hasn't been achieved before, 
for the sake of everyone, the civilian, the innocent civilians, Palestinians who are targeted, and they are not guilty in the crimes of Hamas, and the people in Israel who are, who, who, uh, who are still under missiles and uh, etc. Everybody deserves to live in security, Israelis and Palestinians. And there is a symbiosis. Those who believe that one side can live in peace and security and the other can, uh, at the expense of the other and vice versa, all of those are either stupid bastards, so, sorry for saying that, but I allow myself, or blind, full of, uh, of hatred, or simply liars. There's one way to stop the bloodshed, and this is ending the occupation and achieving a sustainable and a viable peace where the Palestinians have their own independent state besides Israel. No other way. And so what is it? Um, I, wa I want to ask about what, what that state or those states would look like. But before that, what is it that Israel was trying to do with its judicial reform uh, that it's now trying to do through this justification? As I began to say, there is this guy, a thug, a racist, a person who believes in Jewish supremacy profoundly, that really believes in racial theory that resembles some others from other places and other times. His name is Bezalel Smotrich. He's a minister, the finance minister and minister in the Ministry of Defense at the moment. Six years ago, when he was a relatively marginal member of the Knesset, that uh, was to a great extent mocked uh, even by right-wingers because he was seen as a lunatic as he is. <coughs> as a fanatic, a bigot. <laughs> so he published in 2017, six years ago, a plan that is entitled uh, The Subjugation Plan. It is on Google, you can find it, it's in English as well. And this plan consists of three main elements. The first element is that Israel has to annex the all pal territory, uh, occupied Palestinian territories, primarily the West Bank, now he's talking about Gaza, by the way. He's talking quite explicitly uh, about uh, occupying Gaza Strip as a whole, driving out Palestinians and establishing uh, Jewish settlements. So anyway, uh, in this plan, the first point was that Israel has to annex uh, the uh, occupied Palestinian territories without granting basic rights to the Palestinians. That is to say, a, a full-fledged official apartheid regime. The second point that he mentioned, and again, you can Google and find it explicitly on the web. A second point of his was that those Palestinians who are not going to be ready to live as subjects, that is no citizens, but uh, sub subjects, uh, subjugated, uh, those who are not going to accept that are going to be expelled after out of the homeland. And third, those Palestinians who are going to resist their, uh, to this destiny of theirs as subjects are, are going to be killed. This is a plan that this fascist government, headed by Netanyahu, Ben Gvir, Smotrich, and other uh, thugs, this plan is something that the government from the very beginning wanted to realize, at least in, if not in full, at least partly. Uh, and the, the so-called judicial reform, which again, I prefer to call it a coup d'etat, was the means for that. It wasn't the end. It is a, a mistake to concentrate on the coup that the government tried to pursue and refer to this coup as if that was the end of the government. That was the means. Why that was the means? Because the one bulwark or obstacle to realize the subjugation plan was the Supreme Court and the judicial system in general, uh, with some other elements like the, the media, like public uh, opinion, uh, and civil society organizations, etc. So the real end or the real goal of this coup was to eliminate the independence of the judicial uh, system, uh, to subjugate the Supreme Courts primarily to the government, 
to also undermine the independence of the media and to seriously attack the basic civil rights of the citizens. And to, in by that, to remove the obstacles or the hindrances on the way to realize the subjugation plan. Once they failed, thanks to the protest, they needed an alternative under which they can pursue the very same plan. What is the best in a society like Israel, which is in a con uh, under continuous threat, sometimes imagined one, imaginary one, sometimes a real one, doesn't matter for our discussion at the moment. <laughs> uh, what is uh, uh, What has been proven in 70, 75 years uh, as a, a useful means to achieve support from uh, to the government from uh, those who actually oppose the government in uh, in normal days, war or, I, or or a sort of confrontation, not necessarily a full fledged war, you know. And that's what the government wanted. Now I have to emphasize. The government didn't want a massacre like the Hamas did. I'm sure about that. I'm not trying to argue otherwise. I don't believe that anyone can be so crazy. And I said before, I expressed my uh, view regarding the regarding the craziness of this government, to say the least. But I don't believe that anyone can be so uh, mean and crazy to want his own people to be butchered, like happened in Israel in uh, two weeks or almost three weeks ago. So I do not say that the government wanted the carnage that occurred in the South. I do want to say, and I did say, and the ethics committee, again, didn't like it to say the least, is that the government wanted some kind of confrontation that can be used as an excuse to carry out the subjugation plan. And once Hamas committed the crime he did, the government of Israel found the excuse. So, and now it, it carries the, that uh, by uh, using three different uh, strategies. One in front of Gaza, which is, as some experts said, I saw just an interview with an expert to genocide and uh, Holocaust studies from Stockton University, I think, right. in I New Jersey. Uh, yeah. He argues, for instance, that what Israel is doing in Gaza is uh, 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 by the international and the formal definition that the UN gave to genocide is a genocidal assault. And of course, it is accompanied by a uh, forced uh, expulsion. Uh, but for sure, whether we refer to it as a genocide or not, a massacre does happen there. So uh, that's one strategy. The other strategy that Israel has been carrying out in the West Bank and now in further strength uh, is ethnic cleansing by pogroms and uh, committed by settlers under the auspices of the military occupation forces and the encouragement of the government. So, I mean, people must understand that before the, uh, the 7th of uh, October, Settlers on a daily basis used to uh, commit pogroms against Palestinians, either by torching their fields or cut off their trees or attacking them violently uh, uh, by beating them or even sometimes by shooting them or set fire to their houses, uh, sometimes with the people inside. Uh, I visited many places there that suffered those attacks and assaults, everything under the auspices of the military occupation forces of Israel and sometimes with their cooperation and collaboration and protection. Uh, and now, under the smokescreen of the war in Gaza, it's much worse. Now, uh, settlers are easily and freely shooting to death Palestinians. Last week, uh, settlers uh, invaded the Palestinian village or in the West Bank of Kusra, and they shot dead, that is to say murdered, for for civilians, for Palestinians, the day after, the settlers came again to the funeral of those four and shot again to death a father and son. And nobody is arrested, nobody is uh, investigated, let alone charged. This is a Ku Klux Klan kingdom. So 
if, uh, if the settlers resemble the activists of uh, the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, the uh, military resembles Governor Wallace, if you know what I mean. And uh, so that's the, the or, 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 or the police that they uh, normally in the in the deep south during the KKK's uh, domination, you know how they behaved. So there are too many resemblances between the two. Unfortunately, I must say, the formal, the official United States simply doesn't do anything apart from talking, and that that's not enough. In deeds, there's nothing there. Shame on shame on that administration. Shame. And uh, the third uh, strategy is uh, vis-a-vis the Palestinian citizens within Israel and the democratic Jews, which I mentioned before, like uh, all those legal uh, uh, limitations, like the prohibition uh, uh, to demonstrate and to write on the social network, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mentioned it before. So that, in my view, altogether, those three components constitute the realization of the, the uh, subjugation plan that uh, was not realized by the coup, and now it is realized grad- gradually uh, under the smoke screen of the massacre and the war, and as well under the auspices of the international support, especially of the Biden administration. That should be put on an end, first and foremost, because we are talking about war crimes, crimes against humanity, (laughs) uh, 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 and of course, morality. But if I add, unfortunately, there are too many cynical politicians and leaders and governments in the world. So if I just, you know, use the language of interests, that's even the interest of the international community, because I'm warning you, I'm warning you, and remember that, that if it is not stopped now, if there's no ceasefire now, if there's no exchange of prisoners and hostages now, the war is going to extend to the region and, and further. We are on the verge of an international, or if you like a word, war, and everybody is going to pay the price. Now, what I'm saying is unpopular in Israel. I'm hatred. I'm hated. I uh, uh, not only was uh, suspended, but I know that uh, uh, people in Israel threaten me, etc. But I'm committed to justice. I'm committed to the well-being of people. I'm committed to the, my people, my compatriot, even if they hate me. I will speak up and continue with my struggle because it's in my view for their benefits as well. My struggle is not anti-Israeli, it is totally for Israel. I stand with Israel, but not with the government of Israel, quite the contrary. Because I stand with Israel, I stand against the the government of Israel. Because I stand with Israel, I stand with the Palestinians. Because there is a symbiosis. If one people does not enjoy rights and prosperity, so the other people will not enjoy it, and vice versa. People must understand that it's not a zero-sum game, exactly the opposite. So you just offered a very uh, urgent warning, which I would encourage people to listen to, not just because it sounds very wise to me, but you yourself offered another warning about something like what happened on October 7th happening. Can you elaborate on that warning that you had already uh, issued? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Wow. That was a great interview. Really appreciate Ofer Kassif, a member of the Israeli parliament, speaking to us not from Israel. Right now, he's still in Latin America uh, for sharing all that with us. That was really, really powerful. As always, go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com for more And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. 
Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. <laughs>